Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG After Foundation and you are joining us today on the internet for another one of our conversations at home. And we are joined today by John Abrahams who is the director and also stars as Mickey in the film Clover which is coming out on video on demand this week. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. Um, I wanted to kind of ask how your, how your day today has been looking and, and how you've been navigating have, having to pivot all the plans that you had for the release of the film right now. Um, thank you so much for having me. and. Uh, yeah, my day-to-day -day has been looking pretty much like this through the lens of Zoom. I've been doing a lot of Zoom things, um, both personal and, you know, uh, public and a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of promoting uh, our film Clover via social media outlets and, you know, any way we can. Um, <clears throat> I definitely am of an age where I think of movies as coming out in theaters. When I think of going to the movies, I think of movie theaters, um, and that's the same for making them. I, you know, I I made Clover to play on a big screen, and um, you know, it's it's very hard to make a film and nowadays get it released in theaters. So um, it's been a sort of bitter pill to swallow that we had to pivot and just do an on you know a VOD release. However. Um, there are far worse bitter pills being swallowed out there. And, um, you know, I think the silver lining for us is that there's a lot of people at home and they're looking for entertainment and, um, you know, hopefully we can provide them some escapism with That's Clover. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And for people who don't realize, John's actually sitting in front of a virtual background of the film's poster right now. So if his arm disappears at any point, it's That's not right. a shot back in your apartment. That's right. Yes, this is not my, this is some, the miracles of modern technology. <laughs> I know it's so great that we have technology like this to be able to still kind of connect with each other and, and, and have these like, sorts of conversations around film releases. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you about your relationship with Michael Testoni who wrote the script, because this was actually the second time that you'd collaborated together where he wrote the script and you directed it. And I was interested in kind of what you both took away from that experience the first time around that evolved in and really cemented that relationship for Clover. Got it. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, so Michael Testone and I are friends and um, have, you know, collaborated on lots of things. And um, we did collaborate on All at Once and had a really good time. And so I had been kicking around the very beginning inceptions of an idea for Clover for a long time. And, um, you know, when we thought, okay, let's make another movie because that was so much fun. Um, uh, I sort of kicked around my very beginnings of an idea with him and he took it and went off and did his thing. And then, um, you know, we sort of broke story together and then he went off and put his mark on it. And um, that's pretty much what you see when you see the, when the movie, so. Yeah, and what was that collaboration like with him once you actually started filming? Was he still around throughout shooting? Um, did you continue making any edits once you had the cast in place? Yeah, so I mean, you know, look, you're always you're always working while shooting. You're always doing edits. You're oh, you know, and if you're lucky enough to have a situation like Mike and I have, um, he is there on set, and um, you know, I also kind of because I act and direct. I need somebody who I trust's eyes on me as an actor. So I quite often have Mike there behind the monitors, also sort of watching me and being an acting coach <laughs> uh, for me personally. Um, so, you know, so that's definitely how it works on set. Um, and, you know, it, it's always beneficial to have a writer and be like, hey, maybe this, you know, little thing needs some tweaking and he's just right there, you know, doop, 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 and then... Uh, and then you're good. It's 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 great. It's a wonderful experience. So. Was there any other form of feedback that you had when you were filming beyond just um, him being behind the camera and helping with give you notes? Because obviously you're directing yourself in the film, and so you don't have anyone to really say, "Hey, that was really great," but maybe we could just try it with a little bit more of this, or let's do one more take. So, how did you look around everyone around you and use the rest of the cast and the crew for that feedback? Uh, well, you know, I'm kind of like in the scene um, and. You know, directing and acting, it's not that hard for me. I know that it's at least one actor that will listen to me as a director. Um, so there's that. And I can kind of like gauge 
from the other actors in the scene with me. Like if I'm giving them what they need and I'm listening and I'm, you know, doing that. And, um, you know, I do have to trust myself a bit and I do have to kind of, you know, sacrifice some ego, I think for time's sake in, in, in that situation where I go, okay, you know, like I'd rather have this other actor give them more takes on their coverage than me. So if I, if I'm pretty sure I've got what I need from me, I will move on. I won't waste a lot of time with my coverage, you know? Um, but yeah, Mike is really the only one. I mean, you know, people will say things. Uh, my, my best friend, Matthew Quinn, who's my cinematographer, you know, um, I'll rely on him too for like aesthetic things, you know, uh, regarding my performance, but you know, not on acting and stuff. He's yeah. a camera to know about that stuff. And how did, how did the two of you work together in terms of creating the cinematography and, and him really bringing to life the way in which you wanted to use the placement of the camera and the way that you followed your characters to tell the story? Yeah. Um, so I am a visual artist. That's my background. It's one of my backgrounds. Um, so aesthetic is very important to me and I do a lot of preparation and a lot of stuff with that. And my shot lists, my shot lists are very extensive. Um, but you know, Matt is my best friend and we're both a little bit cine nerds. So, and like gear nerds and stuff. And so, you know, we knew, a long time before making Clover what we wanted the aesthetic to be. So we, um, you know, we watched a lot of stuff. We went to like, you know, um, Cinegear conventions and looked at like all the different lenses and, you know, we knew we wanted to shoot it with anamorphic lenses. So we wanted to kind of know which one specifically would be the best for us. And um, we did a lot of stuff like that, a lot of legwork like that, which is fun for me and fun for him. I don't know if everybody would have fun doing it. But. <laughs> I think it's important, you know, and then we got an amazing production designer on Clover Giles Masters, who um, comes from a long line of famous production designers. His father was the production designer on Lawrence of Arabia uh, and 2001. His name's Tony Masters. So um, we got very lucky there with Giles. And um, I spent a lot of time talking to Giles and, you know, collaborating with him on color schemes and all that stuff. I also have a good relationship with a guy named Nat Jenks, who's a film colorist and conform guy. And um, we went to him, me and Matt Quinn went to him, I don't know, six months before we shot Clover and had him design a special LUT for the movie that we felt would give it the look we wanted, you know, which is a sort of throwback film aesthetic. I always want things to be very filmic. Um, you know, we're shooting digitally, but I want things to be filmic. So that's important to me. Yeah. And because you were touching on the, the production design, one of the things that I think you do really well in the film is you really craft spaces that enhance and add to the characters and, and add to the entire atmosphere and, and tone of the film. So how did you set about mapping out just like even down to the nuanced details of the props as well as the locations themselves? Well, here's my answer to that. I, I probably should have been a set decorator. That's the line of work I should have gone into in film. Um, and multiple people have told me that. <laughs> like, I'm constantly tinkering and looking at things when setting up shots. And even while shooting, I'll be like, oh, you know, we got to fly that out of there or whatever. So, um, like I said, I do pay a lot of attention to aesthetic. Um, and, you know, I wanted Clover to feel timeless. You know, there is the use of cell phones, so we know that it's takes place in the, in the last 20 years or so. But past that, we did a lot of sort of paying homage to past decades and past decades in film, um, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you know, and some 90s stuff too. And, you know, films of this kind of genre, these sort of culty midnight films. So we did a lot of stuff work there to, um, to make that, to build that into the art direction, yeah. you know. One of the things I was interested about in terms of the, the genre is that it's very much a genre that we're used to completely male dominated stories and it just being male characters, but there's also really strong women in this and they feel like very fully service characters. So how did you and Mike set about making sure that that was in the initial story conception, the script, and that you were really serving that when you were making the film as well in production? Thank you. I mean, I think both Mike and I um, have a huge appreciation for women period. And, um, 
you know, I think that's also apparent in our first film all at once. Um, you know, Mike writes very well for the female voice. And, um, you know, I think that past that, the movies that this, the films, the genre that this movie pays homage, homage to, um, they're all masculine films and they're all masculine worlds where problems are presented and men have to solve them and that's it. And the women are sort of tertiary to that. Um, we wanted Clover to be the opposite, which I think is a reflection of how the world really works. And I think Mike feels the same, which is that like, you know, this is unfortunately a man's world, but men make this huge mess and women have to come and clean it up. And so that's sort of what we wanted to do with Clover is um, present this very masculine world, but, and uh, very big masculine messes and have the female characters come and pretty much save the day and clean everything up, you know? So, yeah. I can, I can attest to that. <laughs> also, a lot of the cast you had worked with on your previous film as well. So I was interested in, in the, the natural shorthand that that created and how that really helped you both as a director and as a lead actor in the film. Right. So, you know, repertory is really important to me. Um, building one. Um, I love working with people I know or are friends of mine, you know, either people I've worked with in the past or are friends. Um, some of the people in Clover are both of those things. Um, Erica Christensen was in my first film all at once and is obviously in Clover as well and is a very good friend of ours behind the scenes and for a long time. Um, and there's a few other cast members in the film like that. Um, and then, um, you know, there are some newbies in the film too that I hope I continue to work with like Chaz and Ron Perlman. I had not worked with them before in any capacity. Um, Tashina Arnold, I knew from like on a friendly basis from years ago, but we had never worked together. Um, I had always wanted to work with her, but overall it's really a thing where I, I believe you can't buy chemistry. So, you know, anytime you can get people in your films that you have a relationship with one way or another, that's going to show so much in the ether of making the movie. And when you're making indie films or movies in general, you don't often have a lot of rehearsal time. So, you know, it's good to have that chemistry built in before you're actually shooting. And, uh, and you get that Mark Weber and I both came up as actors in New York city 25 years ago. And we used to see each other at auditions all the time. So we knew each other. And so when coming around to casting Clover and, once I realized that I was going to step in and play Mickey, um, I, I felt it was really important to cast somebody that I had some sort of relationship with, you know. And we got really lucky with Mark. Yeah. How did that lend itself with, with Mark to the two of you creating that relationship? Because you're playing brothers in the film, and there's such a great rapport between the two of you from the language to the physicality and the way that you kind of really push each other's buttons. So how did you navigate figuring out those layers, or was it just a very easy process from knowing him for so long already? You know, I think, I think it's just trust. I mean, I think a lot of that is just trust and then vibing. I mean, we were able to do some rehearsals, which were very helpful. Um, but, you know, it's really just trust and respect. And, um, and um, you know, therefore, in the context of the film, these two brothers are forced into this very tense situation. And making movies is a very tense situation. So sometimes you kind of have to, you can just trust and rely on that there's this underlying energy there and that's gonna lend its hand, you know, to the performances. Yeah, I was also interested with Mark and what he brings to the table very uniquely as an actor because he's also like you, an actor who has directed as well. So yeah. he has that, that dual perspective, which I think um, creates a different understanding of what a director is asking for you as a performer. Yeah, so Mark is an, a very talented filmmaker in his own right. Um, and is somebody who acts and directs in the films as well. Um, you know, I think um, both Mark and I come from an indie background predominantly, and we're kind of quirky guys and have quirky interests. And so, um, you know, I think, I think Mark sees that in me and saw that in Clover and what I was trying to do. And so, um, you know, he was able to kind of, turn in what I think is a very quirky, nuanced performance, um, you know, because of that and, and trust that like 
I wasn't going to make a totally standard by the numbers movie of this genre, you know? Right. Cause also it's a genre piece, but there's definitely a lot of comedic moments within there, within the relationship between the two brothers and also the interpersonal relationships between a lot of the characters throughout that. Did you find that that just came very naturally because it comes from the honesty and the truth of who those characters are? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, for me, character is so important and, and humanity is so important. And, um, you know, I try to, I try to have that vibe uh, when making a film that everybody feels comfortable and feels um, able to be vulnerable and honest. And, um, you know, like I said, it is a semi family environment because we work with people that are our friends in real life. Um, And so that energy is there. And, um, and, you know, if you're new to it and you step onto our sets, I think you can feel that and it, it, you know, it puts you at ease and, allows for that to um, <clears throat> come across on the screen. And was that an environment that you wanted to create on set about allowing people to be vulnerable and be very honest through their performances? Did that transcend into the casting process? Because that must be a really unique experience casting when you've also, you know exactly what it feels like when you walk into that room. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, there's two answers to that question. One is that like, you know, in the case of Chaz Palminteri, we had him for a very limited amount of time and, you know, we had to put him through the ringer kind of in this condensed amount of time. Um, and he was a champ, you know, he never complained once and, you know, he, he, he just really went all in. And I think that's because he could probably feel that energy coming from us um, that we're talking about. And then, um, you know, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's like that across the board. Um, I come from an improv background, and so I always like to give actors room to try whatever they want to try. You know, um, I will say that most of what you see on screen is written in the script by Mike Testone, but um, but you know, it doesn't mean I don't allow for all that freedom when shooting. And then you know, we see what works in the edit. You know. Um, it is very helpful for all the moments that aren't dialogue. You know, you get amazing discoveries for the in-between things, which are, as we know, very important. Um, so I also like that vibe across the board, like not just in context of the cast, but also the crew. I approach it where, you know, making a movie is, um, everybody's part of this big brain and everybody's like a neuron that makes up this big brain and you know everybody should feel the ability to fire at all times and uh and contribute to making this brain work and this machine go so that's uh that's what i try to do you know because you were mentioning the the post-production process i was interested in your involvement in that as a director because i you know when you're showing up as an actor on set you're not involved in that part of the process you don't see what goes into it but then when you're right. directing and you're actually sitting there, you're really seeing what works and, and what you really need from each take and all the different coverage and the different angles that you're, you're capturing. So I was interested in how being part of that process has influenced you and enhanced your craft as an actor. Great question. And, you know, I say this a lot, like I think that not just in terms of acting, but obviously in filmmaking, I think, but, you know, the best thing you can do when approaching film acting or filmmaking is to look at it from the eyes of an editor. Um, That's the best thing you can do. I think quite often as actors, you approach filmmaking sort of from the eye of a theater sense. And that's not helpful in movies. You know, I definitely have worked with some wonderful, great big actors in my time as an actor and noticed that they, they edit their performances from the eye of an editor. Um, so that's the best thing you can do is kind of just like learn the basics of editing and then pres- use that when you're on set and think about that. You know, if you didn't get to a place that you wanted to get to when they were doing the wide coverage or a master, you know, you know that maybe you can get it when they're on a 50 mil lens and doing a close up on. So, you know, and it gives you a sort of understanding and more freedom within your performance when on set to take space and kind of, you know, not get in your head and, and no, think that it's, that's the be all end all and not look at your performance from just this one perspective. You know, there's a lot of nuance that happens when the camera's right here, as opposed to when it's back here. So you have a lot of opportunities. 
That's a really amazing perspective that I've actually never heard anyone speak about in that way before. It's really fascinating. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the single best thing for me as an actor or as a filmmaker has been knowledge of editing and how that works. Um, you know, and, and I think it's the most amazing part of making movies is post and the editing process. Um, you know, it's also like the scariest part for me. Um, it's not scary for me shooting a film and acting and directing in it. Like that doesn't freak me out so bad. Um, but you know, once you've, made all once you've got all your pieces and then you're going into post and everything's sort of floating around and has to get sucked together and you know be conducive um to one thing is uh is sort of freaky you know but uh, but amazing as well yeah. you know it's, it's really truly alchemy you know when you're at the beginning of your process and you're coming into playing this character because you've been so involved in and in, in, you, you've lived with the script for such a long amount of time at that point and you really know not just the details of your character but all of them and and how those relationships are going to work in a scene how does that change the way that you prepare as an actor from if you're just getting a script and showing up day one of the shoot sorry ask the question one more time yeah, it's really just about like how your preparation process as an actor was different given that you're so entrenched with the script when you're oh. directing versus when you're just taking a script and showing up on day one on set. As an actor. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's great because I'm like, you know, if I'm just an actor, I kind of know, you know, um, my background and my scenario more than I know the background and scenarios and where every other character is coming from and all, you know, and everything. And so I've had a lot of time to look at the script and think about all that as a director when directing something. Uh, and so when I show up as an actor, there's like, I'm just so well informed, you know, um, for me, preparation is a big thing whether I'm directing or acting, um, I like to be very well prepared. But at the same time, you know, I think like one of the rules of acting is you do all your preparation and then you throw it away when you get on stage um, or on set. Uh, so I do throw a lot of that away, but you know, there's so much more built in because I am so well informed as a director, uh, having looked at the script a million times before I'm looking at it as an actor, you know? Yeah. And given that you really want to make sure that you're prepared as a director, as you just mentioned, um, what were some of the most valuable parts of pre-production and, and preparing to come onto set that you made as a director beforehand? Um, well, I think, you know, in our case, we kind of knew that Clover was going to be our next movie, even before the entire screenplay was written. And so we, and we knew what kind of film it was going to be. And so, um, you know, we did a lot of location scouting before the script was written, um, which is really helpful, not just for me, but also for Michael Testone, um, you know, and he was able to build these actual locations into the script. And that's helpful for me as a director because I'm already seeing these sets and situations in my mind, you know, and mapping them out with shot listing a year before we're going to shoot the movie. You know, so I have all that um, going in. That's very helpful. And certainly in the case of Clover, very helpful. Um, there's a lot of locations and a lot of characters and a lot of moving pieces and uh, yeah, and all that, you know. Yeah. So that in the case of Clover, that was probably the most beneficial thing. But all of it, watch as many movies as you can think of that are inspirations for what you're doing, whether that's as an actor or as a director or as a production designer or whatever it is, you know, um, I scour the internet for photographs that I believe are good references because, you know, your thing as a director is it's sort of like you, it's like when you're a kid and you're playing and it's like, Hey, I've got an idea for a game and you need everybody to get on board and see that game in their head too. And understand how, you know, it's it can be hard to convey that to 150 people and get them behind your vision. So you have to, you know, you have to have an arsenal of stuff to show them sometimes and make it very clear. Yeah. And you ultimately landed on shooting the film in Buffalo. So I was interested in, in how you landed on that decision. And then also it sounds like you were shooting in winter and what some of the challenges of, of filming in Buffalo in winter. Right. 
So um, we made our first film all at once, uh, which is available on Amazon Hulu. It came out a couple years ago um, uh, in Buffalo, New York. And the reason for that is twofold. One is my best friend, Matthew Quinn, who's my cinematographer, is born and raised there and um, lives there. And so he sort of felt like he wanted to give some love to the Buffalo Film Commission and the Buffalo Film Crew, which is a wonderful film commission and crew. Um, so we had shot there for our first film and we had sort of noticed a lot of locations that we felt would lend their hand well to Clover. Like I said, we already had the initial beginnings of the idea before. Um, so there was that. And then also, you know, Western New York, or I think in this case now, all of New York, despite the five boroughs, um, offers one of the best tax rebates there are. Uh, so in the nation. So, you know, that's always a handy thing when you're making indie films is if you're going to get a little money back from your tax rebate, that's very helpful. Yeah. So that's why we landed in. And, and then yes, Clover, the hardest thing about shooting Clover was that we shot it in Buffalo in the winter. Um, but you know, the silver lining there is that in context of the film, you have a lot of people thrust into like a very intense situation and it's very tense and it's very quick. And you know, the extreme cold 10 degree weather shooting all nights, you know, lends its hand to that ether so well, like, you know, it's uh, a little less preparation the actors have to do to constantly be in that sort of titrated energy place over a long period of time, you know? Yeah. I also feel like anytime that you're making an independent film, that it's all, there's always going to be obstacles and limitations that you have to overcome. And, and with that in mind, I wanted to ask if there's a particular scene in the, in the film that you're, you're proudest of having achieved and whether it's from the directing standpoint or as your performance as an actor. Oh, um, wow. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, let's see. Let's let me answer that first as a director. Um, there's so much. I mean, I, <laughs> that, are there any scenes? Well, I, um, I really love, I don't want to give anything away, but I really love the sort of very end sort of recap of the film. Um, there's a flashback sequence that came together really nicely, in my opinion. Um, it's not something that I was sure was going to work as well as it did going in. And, and I think it came together very nicely um, as a director. Um, also, you know, overall, I would say like the fact that I think we've been able to blend all of our sort of references so well into Clover and have it be its own thing, um, is what I'm most proud of as a director. As an actor, um, I, I really like the last scene in the film, which I don't want to give away, but uh, I really like the last scene in the film. It's, uh, it's very intimate in a, in a specific way. And, um, you know, I really like how that came together, but there's so much of that. Um, I loved working with Tashina. I loved working as an actor. Um, I loved working with Chaz. I loved working with all those actors, you know, and I hope I continue to work with them too. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see what you do next, especially if it's going to be with this amazing group of people. Um, and I hope that everyone watching this will check out Clover on Video On Demand, which comes out April 3rd. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it.